Good evening. A Dunedin man has been sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of 17-year-old Jane McClellan four months ago. After the jury returned a verdict of guilty, the judge told 22-year-old Andrew McMillan the only sentence was life. Three Southland designers emerged from obscurity to national prominence at last night's Benson and Hedges Design Awards. The night really belonged to teenager Andrew Horton. Lee Davies was at the awards. A dramatic black and white ensemble from Helen Barber. With plenty of modern personality from the wee suit and long, long jacket from Tanya McVicker. The clothes are stunning and the competition fierce. Almost 700 entries from 400 New Zealand fashion designers. And three of those designers who made it to the final are from Invercargill. Andrew Horton in the wool section. Diane McKenzie, high fashion daywear. Anne Lyon, high fashion daywear. The capital city's a long step from Southland in more ways than one. But already Andrew has friends here in the fashion world. Andrea Thomas has been something of a mentor. She's encouraged him in his ambition to attend design school, but at the same time made him aware of the difficulties he's likely to encounter in the trade. Not the least of those is competition from other designers. Ray Richardson is also in your section tonight. This is one of her gowns. She's specialising basically on New Zealand mohair, which is excellent. She's already started exporting. Mm. Wool, well, naturally, is a hot topic of conversation. Both Andrew and Andrea love working with it. The natural wool is mm. bliss to work with, and also yeah. for businesswomen that I'm dressing, it's so much easier, easier. to wear yeah. and look after. Yeah, and it comes down well. You press it up well. Get the right effect. This right. Good New Zealand stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Diane McKenzie and Anne Lyon, meanwhile, are getting ready for the big night, and they're aware that their clothes, on and off stage, will be closely scrutinised. I wouldn't get the earring on with that, with those on. So long as you make sure that's nice and smooth, so your gold piece is straight, and the ladies here. There's always time, though, for shopping. Along with Barbara White, their milliner, Anne and Diane spend some time finding out whether fashion in the capital is any different from fashion in Invercargill. However, like Andrew, they have no real expectations of winning tonight. No, not in the least, no. I mean, I've got this far and I'm pretty chuffed with this. So uh, anything else is a bonus. So that's what I'm just expecting. At Wellington's Michael Fowler Centre, hundreds of other designers are telling themselves the same thing. For almost all of them, it's enough to have made it this far. From the Michael Fowler Centre, Wellington. The Benson and Hitches Fashion Design Awards 1989. An optical illusion makes a cropped bolero jacket look longer than it really is. Andrew Horton of Invercargill lines it up with pleated collots for a clever effect. And here they are again, the Fashion and Wool nominees. And the three highly commended are Maisie. Thank you. Annie Bonza. Andrew Horton. And Robert Gorman. I'm delighted to present the Fashion in Wool Award to Andrew Horton. You said before that just being nominated was enough. Mm. But getting the star is it's even better. <laughs> Do you think this is going to change your life, Andrew? I think so. In yeah, more way. Oh, yeah. You look good now. Oh. Oh, I just think I'm, people will know who I am now and what I'm about and that I'm serious and here for one thing. And I'm. Yeah. New Zealand's always been portrayed as the great outdoors, awash with good keen men hell-bent on hunting, shooting and fishing. But although we have 350,000 licensed firearm owners, very little's known about how often they shoot or how much game they take. As Bill Cochran reports, a national survey of hunting may answer the questions. 
Up until the advent of commercial hunting from helicopters, government colours and private shooters waged war on deer, but seldom looked like eliminating what was regarded as a noxious animal. In just a couple of decades, with feral meat, alive or dead, assuming high values, the recreational shooter discovered bagging a deer to be no longer easy meat. A postal survey of firearms owners is underway to discover what they're shooting, how often they hunt, and the impact of recreational hunting. From the responses to date, it looks as though perhaps about half the people still use their firearms to shoot the odd rabbit, and maybe only about 10%, 20% are actually involved in big game hunting. I didn't think there was such a thing as an odd rabbit, that there are only millions of them. Well, there are certainly millions of them, and hunters take millions of them. Uh, perhaps two or three million by the look of results today. Apart from the bunny, what else are we shooting? Um, lots of other small game, possums and hares. Of the big game, the surprise is that pigs are the number one uh, big game animal taken. Why pigs and goats. Why do you say surprise? Um, I guess we've always tended to think of the big game hunter as a deer hunter. Uh, this survey suggests that he may in fact be a pig hunter. Of the larger animals, feral goats figure along with pigs at the top of the hunted list, while the more exotic animals, such as tar in their remote habitat, are pursued by a relative few. But be it bunnies or boars, or birds the Barry Crumps of our world are blasting, Graham Nugent's survey aims to provide the first reliable information base for everybody, be it commercial interests examining the resource, recreational interests lobbying for their sport, or the Department of Conservation, wishing to discover just how many keen men or women are shooting over their land. As Dunedin's Scottish Week draws to a close, around a thousand bandsmen and women have converged on the city for the New Zealand Pipe Band Contest. It's the 60th year the competition's been held, and as Bernard Buck reports, there are more than 40 bands taking part. Long before competition got underway today, bands were out in force practicing for the various events. On the market reserve, McAlpine's North Canterbury Band was going through its paces, and in Queen's Gardens, the City of Timaru Band was getting into gear. Other bands like John McGlashan's were fine-tuning right up to the time of entering the park. But it was inside the grounds of Carisbrook that most of the action's taking place. With 43 bands competing in the various events, including two from Australia, there'll be no shortage of competition. Pipe band contests may not be everyone's cup of tea, but according to former drum major of the City of Dunedin Pipe Band, for those that take part, it's an event to remember. We've worked hard for 12 months. They've raised a lot of money to get themselves from one end to the other. Uh, there's been a lot of enthusiastic practice done, either on grass to learn their marching events or in halls around the country for the uh, piping and drumming. From what was once largely a male pastime, there are now many women taking part, including members of the judging panel. Well, they're looking for, really, uh, a sound initially, and that is a very mystique thing in, in bagpipes and it's the way the drones are tuned to, to give a harmonic sound. The street march will be held tomorrow morning with the grand finale at Carisbrook on Sunday afternoon. A new aquatic sport has hit Dunedin. It's wave riding. Similar to surfing, it's already become a rage in the North Island and is spreading south. Kim Haring went to the first day of the South Island wave riding champs at St Clair this afternoon. Wave skiing is like a cross between surfing and surf canoeing. Its main appeal is that it's easier than surfing and even a recreation for the disabled. People who use wave skis generally are, are surfers as well, board riders. The appeal is if you're actually starting out, it's actually a lot easier to ride. Um, as a recreational sport, it's, it's really easy to latch onto. You get satisfaction pretty quickly without having had any prior experience. So when you get out there on a wave, what are you trying to do? Uh, Really, you, you, you pick up, look at the wave and see what you can do on it, and then you, you do as many turns as you can. Basically, it's, and you look for the, a nice sucky section where you can maybe do a pull off an aerial or a re-entry, um, and just stay on, the board, stay on the wave as long as you can, and get as maximum speed. The conditions at Sinclair today were almost perfect for the first round of the South Island Champs. A metre plus swell breaking right and left, and a drizzle that made for stable conditions. Although today was only round one of the competition, some surfers were already shining through. Mark Allingford and the Mitchell brothers, Dave, Peter and Tim. 
Today the 30 competitors went through the first round of competition. Only one or two of them are from Dunedin and one from Invercargill. The finals are at St Clair on Sunday. And he's hoping the weather picks up at the weekend, but I think the forecast says it will on Sunday. Half Moon Bay was cloudy with 15 degrees today. Invercargill showers in 13, a high tomorrow 14. Gore had 13 degrees, Balclutha raining 17, Dunedin rain in 17, 14, a high for tomorrow. Palmerston, it was spitting, 22 degrees, Omru 21, Ranfilly 17, Lumsden 14, Queenstown cloudy in 20, Wanaka cloudy 21, the high again to Alexandra of 25 degrees. It was showery in Teano at 3 and 17 degrees. Have a good weekend. We'll be back on Monday. Good night.